Hello, everyone. Welcome to At Percussion. This is episode five, and I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi. Today is August 16th, 2015. With us right now is Laurel Black. Hi. Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. And Megan Arns is on her way. She's in route. She'll probably come in a little late. Our guest this week is uh, has been the principal of the Atlantic Symphony Orchestra since 1999, and he's Atlanta. now the newest member of... What was that right? <laughs> I think he said Atlantic. Oh, <laughs> Atlanta <laughs> Symphony Orchestra <laughs> since 1999, and he's now the newest member of the Cleveland Orchestra and he's been the director of the Modern Snare Drum Competition since 2008, and he's also the artistic director of Sonic Generator. Uh, Tom Sherwood, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me here, man. Atlantic Symphony? Yeah, that's yeah, weird. Yeah, come on, that's really insulting. But yeah, that's very strange. happens, yeah. That's like, that's <laughs> like Is a that big... like in Atlantic City with, <laughs> with casinos and stuff? Like... No, that's, a, that's like a pet peeve, and whenever we have like a pop... Um, like a pop artist come and they're singing with the orchestra, and I mean, you can always tell they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Where are we? But yeah, the Atlantic Symphony Orchestra, that, that happens. But I'll, well, I'll forgive you this time. <laughs> it's, it's the symphony for a whole ocean. It's much, <laughs> much, bigger, than, it's much bigger than a state. It's much bigger yeah. than Georgia. Uh, but man, con congratulations on winning the Cleveland job. That's so cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm real excited for it. What, um, let's see, I saw in your bio also you just came back from Teton Festival, is that right? Yeah, I've been there, uh, I think this was my 11th year doing that, yeah. Wow, I, I, I don't know if you know, I'm from Utah, <clears throat> and I used to drive, friends and I, we maybe drove um, three or four times to that when we were, oh, when yeah. we were younger. Oh, yeah? Yeah, maybe so once that when uh, was that when they still had, did they have students there? They're just like the professional, they, they used to have a little like student and, and you'd go there and, um, but I don't know when that switched, but it was probably after, after you started doing that. I, I definitely saw like professional groups playing, in fact I saw, I saw Bob Becker and I, I think it was Bill Kahn. Oh, okay. Uh, play Rachmaninoff uh, symphonic oh, really? together. <laughs> That's cool. The yeah, yeah, so that was really cool. I was just there in uh, the Sun Valley um, Symphony Festival. Festival. I don't know how, what the exact name of that is, but um, did that for the summer too, which was cool. I've never spent much time in Idaho. That's a, a really beautiful state. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I really, now that I've gone away from northern Utah, I yeah. realize how beautiful that area was. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Well, cool, man. It's so great to have you here. Um, Laurel, when we were cleaning out this office, you found a book that I hear people talk about quite often, and it follows a lot of the same topics that um, students ask about as far as being prepared for things in life and musical careers. you want to tell us a little bit about what you've been reading this week? Yeah, yeah. So while we were cleaning out Bill's office, I came across uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is a book that probably all of us have heard of many times. And as a kid, I remember seeing a copy of it in my dad's office and in my grandpa's office. And, you know, so now I'm finally getting around to reading it. And it's funny how much uh, it's resonating with me just as a new musician in a new city. And you know, figuring out, okay, people need to know that I'm here, so I need to prepare some type of concert to take around. I have to do the cold call thing, the cold email thing. Essentially, follow what Stephen Covey calls the first habit, which is to be proactive. Um, and this is, of course, something that all of us know about, and, and you know that usually in order to kind of establish yourself somewhere, especially if you're new, you need to be proactive about it and not wait for anything to come to you because if you wait, it won't. Uh, so you have to kind of make it yourself. Uh, but as I was reading, what I got to thinking about, especially in terms of what we do as artists and musicians, is that being proactive in terms of our own performing careers or professionally, that's kind of a small scope. That's a very kind of, you know, microscopic view of that idea of being proactive and 
what I started to wonder about was that the larger idea, the kind of macrocosmic effect of each of us deciding to really try to make something happen, to bring music to a community, ends up being rather, um, instead of just about ourselves, is very much about arts advocacy. And I don't know about you guys, I'd be really interested to know what you have to say, but for me that wasn't always connected, that me trying to, you know, be known around here as a percussionist or a marimbist connected to advocating for the arts, but I really think um, that it does, and uh, it really corresponds to something that Stephen Covey talks about in this first chapter with proactivity called a circle of concern, and I've drawn little diagrams for this that Casey's going to edit in to uh, the video. Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying that like being proactive for yourself and like trying to get yourself out there and, and when you're helping yourself you're actually helping the whole scene and the arts at, at, at large because you're not just you're not just filling say a job vacancy that's open and already exists but you're perhaps being proactive to create something new and you're actually like expanding things yeah yeah exactly and, and I have a a diagram about this that um, in terms of what we can each influence as people it might feel very small to us and perhaps our little victories like presenting a solo recital at a church or some other small venue within our towns feels really tiny but it's actually a much bigger deal within the entire scene of what we're doing and essentially what we can influence is much bigger than what we might think. Um, and I, hearing about everything that you've done, Tom, I would wonder how you feel about this having been part of a symphony orchestra, which is kind of one of those things that everybody aims towards, and how those advocate for what we do, and starting a chamber group, how that does it. You've started a competition. Um, when you did those things, you know, were you thinking that this could really change the artistic scene of Atlanta or what you were doing or um, I mean it, I guess I said absolutely yeah but I don't I mean in some ways I think the impetus might have been more selfish in some ways I mean originally with the chamber with the, the news group I mean there was um, I, I mean I'm really drawn to contemporary music and I, I just I love uh, so Our much of what's sort of out there um, and would like to go to concerts and see concerts and, and in play in concerts and and, um, and that wasn't really happening for I mean there might be an occasional chamber music concert or something and, and I wasn't necessarily getting to play those um, or I'd see like you know oh this this particular thing is happening in New York City or in Chicago or something and um, and so I just kind of kept finding myself saying, oh, this is a drag. I wish it could be, you know, I wish something like that was going on here. And so finally it just kind of seeped through my, you know, my mind. Well, and just do it yourself then. If, if you want to be a part of something like that, then just make it happen for yourself. Um, and it's sort of the same thing with the, uh, with the competition. Um, that there's not, there's not like, a, well, there's, there's, you know, some music schools here around the city. There's Georgia State, and there's a, a place about uh, 30 minutes away, and UGA, which is also about an hour away from here. Um, and I wasn't really teaching any of those, and I really like being around, um, the, you know, the, the stage of development that the kids are you know, in their early 20s and in, and in high school as well. Um, and so I just, to me, that was like... A, one way I felt like I could influence the, the local scene here but um, but could also maybe attract um, you know talent from um, elsewhere around the country to come here and that, that I could be a part of that I could um, invite you know other um, professionals to come here as well and so it, I mean it's sort of a com I don't know how you break it down but it's sort of a combination of um, you know wanting to own artistic desires and aspirations but, but 
you know, that's definitely tied into then improving the artistic life of where you know wherever you're you're living at that time. With the Atlanta snare drum competition, or the modern snare drum competition, um, I know every year there's like a, a commission piece or two, um, mm -hmm. and I know you also have your chamber group that you've started, and I was looking at the, the instrumentation for it, and it seems like it's a Perot ensemble, so right. there's already kind of an established repertoire for that to a certain extent. Um, did you try to focus on that existing repertoire, or did you bring, did you commission composers to create new pieces? I mean, for the competition or for the chamber group? For the chamber group. Well, the chamber group is, I mean, it's a Perot ensemble plus percussion, but, I mean, that's just like the core... Um, I mean, that's sort of like what everything kind of orbits around, but if there's Pete, you know, we did a piece that was like a, a new score to uh, the Fritz Lang Metropolis film, and it had like uh, 20, 20 some people in there, or oh, yeah, like music for 18 at some point, you know, like whatever. Um, it's just interesting to do. We do, yeah. but it's always, it always uses those, those people, gotcha. that, you know, that core group. And try sometimes that's you know we do not just only involve that, but um, but that that's just sort of the main like group of people that all kind of were like yeah let's 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 do this and let's play some jam music. And, gotcha. Um, so I mean there's not been there's not been that much commissioning for for that, um, because and that's basically because. I mean, we're 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 getting by on just like beans as it is. Um, yeah, it's fun. I mean, it's it's you know it squeaks by barely getting funded. Um, but we've done like a ton of stuff um, with the limited resources that we have. We we have, but I've i pretty much commissioned one or two pieces every year. Um, but that that's a totally different. Um, Situation. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm paying for a lot of that myself. Um, so, speaking of speaking of commissions, I know when we did the competition together, um, you you told me one commission story that was supposed to cost one thing, and then the person asked for another thing after, and oh. uh, we, we kind of had a laugh because, of course, yeah. you couldn't have that commission. Right. <laughs> um, it was very expensive. Us, I don't know. Can you tell us a few stories about? Maybe kind of relating to what Laurel said, like how how have you been proactive in in making these commissions happen, and I don't know, making this thing as as vibrant as as it is. Because credit to the competition, like everyone knows about it. Mm -hmm. I go so many places, and people talk about it as like one of the competitions that mm -hmm. a percussionist should do. And real quick, before Tom answers that, I just wanted to say that the repertoire that competition has created is just amazing to me because. Going to recitals, but actually before the competition existed, there weren't that many, I would say, great, truly solo snare drum pieces. There was Prim, of course, and there were you know a handful of others kind of like Prim. Um, but for the most part, I wasn't really all that excited ever to hear a snare drum piece on a recital. And then all of a sudden, we started getting pieces like Stop Speaking by Andy Akiho mm -hmm. and Casey's piece and the... Um, oh, God, why am I blanking on the composer's name? It starts with an M. Uh, Mark anyway. yeah. yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so uh, all these pieces have just been, I think, a fantastic addition to the repertoire. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, I don't know. I just always... Uh, I just have always had a, a real love for playing snare. Drum. And I guess that's... <laughs> that's a little geeky, I guess. But, I mean, I, I grew up in marching bands, and I was in a drum corps for one year. And... Uh, it's just been something I, I mean, and just when I started getting into the classical thing, I was just always like, I mean, that was sort of the, um, that I, I got into classical music. I just, I think the first recording, the, the first I ever kind of really zoned in on was um, this old Ormandy recording of, uh, with Phil Philadelphia of Tanikij. And then just hearing like, um, that, that was Charlie Owen playing snare drum, and then like hearing him play uh, Capriccio Espanol. I just was really in, taken by the sound of all that, and just the um, just the art of of what I thought of was an art of snare drumming. And uh, I mean, I still remember. I, I grew up in Virginia, a place uh, called Drums Unlimited. Anna, did you ever go there? 
No. It was in, it was in Bethesda. And it had like this really amazing um, music store, but it had this really great collection of, of cheap music. And so, and you could just go there, and it was just in these big file cabinets, and you could just, you know, you pull it out, and then I just would sit there and go through and look at all this music. And I remember seeing, you know, coming across the De La Clue Etudes there, just being, like thinking this was like a totally, you know, this was like a, a step, you know, discovering like a new language or something. Um, so I don't know. I've just always really been drawn to snare drumming, and and you know, since I've since I've kind of a, a been around as a student, you know, it's like the whole marimba, um, solo marimba scene has just really like, you know, it's it's exploded. I mean, since the 80s and 90s, and uh, it seems like so many people focus on that. And I was just kind of like, I just thought there was a um, space for the, the snare drum to occupy the same um, amount of attention, I guess, that there is in that in that field. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and the, I mean, the, the other thing that I, I was kind of really drawn, uh, that I'm still drawn to about the snare drum is just that it's like, to me, it's one of the oldest, uh, it, we can trace its roots back far for, for our instrument. I mean, not, not like, you know, much, much farther than we can for like playing, you know, the xylophone or, or marimba. Um, I mean, it's so. I, I just feel like there's a great depth to the, that can be traced way back, and so I kind of like having that. You know, you can go and play something like, um, you know, something like Three Camps, and then have something that somebody just wrote today. Um, that that's why I was uh, when I'm getting people to commission new pieces. I mean, I. I'm just trying to further that um, the evolution of the instrument. I mean, like everybody is that's commissioning new pieces. Maybe, maybe tell us kind of, um, yeah, the the process of commissioning or how you yeah. pitch, pitch this idea to people. Or I mean, you you probably okay, approach. yeah. I mean, normally it's uh, I've tr I try to do like one or two a year, and it really just comes down to people that. Um, I don't know. I sort of search around and uh, you know listen to pieces online and check out videos, and I try to find people that I, I just think uh, could potentially. I mean, you never know what you're going to get, right, when you commission somebody, but potentially could, you know, lend something new and and interesting to the to the instrument. I mean, that's how I, I first came across came across you, Casey. Um, and you, you know, it was like I, I thought that your approach to what you were writing seemed like really um, completely different, um, or a, just a unique way of writing that you didn't really hear before. That was not your standard, um, you know, something that's just uh, like your, you know, kind of a serone etude or just what, what it was just a real B flat um, solo, kind of uninteresting to me, but. See Ben, I told you I don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. I find, uh, and it, it's kind of uh, to me, uh, it's like finding people that e are either compo uh, percussionists themselves and composers, or um, somebody that just you know seems to have an affinity for percussion. And then you know, I normally give them a little spiel about what I think about the snare drum, and um, and you know, they tend to people tend to really get interested in it pretty pretty easily so has there ever have has, not to name any names but has there ever been anyone that was not interested and like what were some of the things they said that kind of deterred them or has everyone just kind of gone for it I've never had anybody uh, turn me down I don't think so uh, well that's good yeah, I, remember <laughs> I, asked, uh, I remember asking Jean Geoffroy Right. I, mean, I asked him if he had any people, if, if he knew of any young um, composers in Paris that he could recommend, and he thought about that for a while, and then he got back and said he wanted to do it. So, um, yeah, but I can't remember anybody that, that said that they, they weren't interested. So will the competition follow you to Cleveland? Yeah, I mean, I'm still working that out. Um, and I have like I'm on a, I have a year leave from Atlanta 
this season. So if you know if I decided to that I for whatever reason wanted to go back to Atlanta, I could still do that. But um, in the meantime, I sort of have to uh, you know I have to make a plan one way or the other. And the the plan right now is to, is to take it there because I mean, it would I'll be there, and it's just it, logistically I could bring it back here, but. Uh, it used, the, the orchestra hosts the competition, the ASO, they always have, and they, um, you know, I mean, I've been able to make it happen because they might, like, uh, they might come the complaint to the judges in and might not charge me for the, the theater space or um, I can like, piggyback onto the website, that kind of thing. But they're never, like, um, they don't, it's like, Paying lots of like hard cash to you know to fund things. So, I know Tom that you studied at University of Illinois with Tom mm -hmm. Siway. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. um, and I know he was a, a big advocate for a new repertoire, and he's one of these kind of percussion repertoire geniuses. Um, could you talk a little bit? Did did he have an influence on you in all this in any you know sense? Well, yeah, I'm, I mean just that you know U of I. Really rich history of uh, music. Um, I mean, it was like the first school that Paul Price started, like the, the first percussion ensemble, and uh, just really, really great new music scene. And I mean, we taught this. I can't remember what the like, title of it was, but it was basically like a. I, I just always thought it was so cool. I was just seeing a course in college about it was like the history of you know percussion ensemble and history of new music. And, um, so yeah, that 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 school had a really big influence on me in that regard, and I had, um, I mean, when I was at the end of my time there, I was going, to, I had, I was going to either go to Germany, and um, and 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 study there, and, and still, presumably like try to follow sort of a, a new music path, uh, a contemporary music path, or, or I was going to go. Um, if I got into Temple, I was going to go there and study with Mr. Abel. Um, and Saiwi was like, I mean, at that time, things are a lot different now. That There's, you know, there's all these uh, percussion ensemble groups and, and chamber ensembles and people making solo careers and making a living playing contemporary music. But at, at that time, it, it definitely seemed, uh, it was definitely like a much more precarious, you know, um, Thing to embark upon, and Stevie, you know, I just remember him talking, asking me if I liked eating cans of beans because that was all, to, <laughs> you know, to feed myself. With if I tried to do, um, you know, if I went down that that route, um, but and I, I mean, I really truly had a passion for for the orchestra thing. I just, you know, that that seemed like it had its own, uh, you know, sketchy path to walk, um, but. Yeah. I went to you know the temple and uh, and I had had all these uh, by that point I had just had all these uh, great feelings for Philadelphia and that whole scene that I, I was kind of thrilled to, to, to do that so that that it, that's kind of always been my two things that I've tried to to maintain is you know is the my thing with the orchestras but then also um, having some sort of foot in just like the music world and I think the competition has has served that for me that I can commission new pieces for that. Um, and the chamber group is just a, like a great um, artistic outlet for me. I've done so many um, really satisfying things through that. So, so speaking, you know, I, I think a thing that a lot of people want to know, um, you do all these things, Sonic Generator, the snare drum competition, how, and, and of course your principal of Atlanta Symphony, um, how amongst all that did you also prepare an audition and go win like another huge job? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, well, I, okay. So, I, I mean, that's that's a tough one to answer. I mean, I've been I've taken like a, a handful of auditions over the years um, since I've since I've been here sixteen years. Um, and that, and and they, all, you know, I mean, that they they were all quite a struggle. I mean, to to prepare, but um, 
I think at some point, you know, it's like you get these things in your hands, and, and it doesn't take that much, you know, that much time to then get them in your hands again. But it's like the, the it, I think there's like a cumulative uh, effect that, that the more you do that, it's like it, the sooner and the, the more readily available it, it is to you. So, uh, I mean. There, there's that that I feel like I had. It, it's not like I just pulled this out of thin air. I feel like I was kind of doing that um, off and on over the years. But I mean, I definitely, I'm not like I'm not a, a, all that much of an organized person that I, you know, I can plot out all these. Um, you know, I'm going to practice this amount of time every day, or I'm going to like, you know, wake up at six and do, you know, from six to seven. I mean, I, I never could do that. Little changes, you know. Every and then you know there's like things will come up. My kid needs I need to do this with my my wife and I need to go out and do this. So uh, I don't know. I guess to me it would be more. Of, it was more of a, a matter of um, finding ways to like not uh, to manage like the burnout, like, so that, so that I wouldn't be burned out from practicing too much. So that that would mean like. Managing, you know, like how much uh, how much rest I get, or um, or, try, or trying to be like really just about, um, if, you know, if I had like a whole day free, or if I had like a whole morning free, I say, okay, I've got all morning free. I'm just gonna practice till I till I drop, you know, like just trying to say, okay, I've got all morning free, but I'm gonna practice for like, you know, an hour and a half, and then I'm gonna take a half an hour break. And then practice another hour or whatever, trying to trying to manage um, that sort of thing. And then I think probably to me, like the past couple of years, I feel like one of the biggest impacts for me has just been getting like a uh, a better handle on um, like managing my uh, my energy level. I guess if that's the way to say this, just that like. Uh, how I eat and um, what I eat, so that if you know if the only time that the time that I could practice was like two o'clock in the afternoon, to know that like I'm not going to be passed out because you know I've had like this really like heavy low key lunch to eat or that I was you know full of sugar or something. So figuring out how, like what works for me so that I sort of have you know. I can sustain my energy throughout the day as, as best as possible. But, um, yeah, I mean, also just like saying, you know, maybe making plans for like, I'm not, even if I had like a Sunday that I didn't have anything to do, maybe say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to practice at all this day again to sort of manage that, um, that burnout because that's, that's always, I tend to have like, um, I can just like really just go and go and go and go, um, and like really drive myself, and I just like, and then I'm fried. And uh, so trying to be able to sustain something over the long term is, uh, and, and figure out how to, like I say, how to manage that um, from getting burned out was a big deal. You, you know, I was recently in um, in a company of uh, some other percussionists, and many of them are on the. Uh, orchestral audition circuit mm -hmm. and they were talking about you winning Cleveland and their feeling was uh, like wow that doesn't happen you know mm -hmm. like someone someone who is at that stage in their life and has been a principal of a major orchestra that long um, and is doing all these other things like that's that's not the person that that goes and wins this awesome job. So they thought it was so cool, and I think it's really cool too. Because in my mind, um, it seems like that is what should happen. Like it should be someone. It should be someone with your experience. Because we always hear about the the young hotshot like straight out of grad school who's been doing nothing but excerpts for years, and they win the gig. Um, and then they lose the gig uh, mm -hmm. because <laughs> they can't keep the gig, you know. Right. Um, so anyway, I mean, I, I hope I didn't just insult several people, but like, no, no. It's, I mean, I definitely uh, the past, like I could say, I've, it's, I mean, I've taken a number of auditions, especially in the past couple of years, 
And I definitely felt like one of the, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm 44 and, um, I would definitely feel like, you know, I'm like the oldest cat in the, in the, in the room right now. But, um, I don't know. I was always trying to make it like, a, you know, I go into an audition that it's, I try not to, to ever have that mindset that you know, we have these preconceived, um, you know, this is supposed to happen or that's supposed to happen or, um, you know, oh my God, this person's here or that person's there. I've just always tried to just make it like a personal, uh, this was just, you know, about me doing my own thing and, um, you know, happen to be 44 and have been here for a long time, but, um, yeah, I didn't, um, I don't know. I, I try not to let that be a, a, you know, get into my mind too much, but. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Hey, Megan, Hello. welcome. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Hi, Tom. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Tom, this is, this is Megan Arns. Hey, Megan, have you ever heard of the Atlantic Symphony Orchestra? No. Oh, well, I introduced Tom as the principal of the Atlantic <laughs> Symphony Orchestra, um, which is, of course, the Atlantic Ocean's Orchestra. Yeah. So yeah. He's it's like, on a bar? He's, That's yeah. all the time. He's pretty good. Yeah. Sebastian the Crab is the conductor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got little yeah. claws with a baton. Sure, sure. <laughs> Laurel, I, I, I see you have a question here. In the I little, do, uh, and, and I know that we need, to, yeah, we need to move on to different topics. And, and I've been trying to think of a way to ask this without getting in trouble with everybody out there that wants to be in an orchestra. Um, yeah. But it connects to... Yeah, arts advocacy and, and what you were just asking, Casey. And, you know, for like 200 years, classical musicians have been writing to each other that orchestras are dying, that mm. that they're going to fold, and yet they're still here. Um, and I know while I was in school, and I would guess probably everybody here, because we're close enough in age, everybody is saying, you know, there's this balance between, yeah, you can get an orchestra. That's going to totally work. You can get an orchestra gig, or it's completely bleak. Like, they're all going to close by the time you're out, by mm -hmm. the time you have a chance to audition. I think everybody approaches that differently. I mean, Atlanta's had, um, I don't know if you know of any of the, their recent history, but, we, I mean, it's been like a really rough couple of years here. We've had, the orchestra's been locked out um, to contract. Well, we were locked out, I don't, I don't, it was maybe like four years ago, or three years ago, and then we were locked out um, this past season for like the first uh, or ten weeks of the season, and uh, and that's you know I mean that's it's for a number of reasons. I mean it's not because people aren't interested in the community so much, but it's definitely like there's funding, um, you know, funding issues, and there's it's it's just very complicated to. To, it's too hard to point at like what exactly the the problem is, but I mean here, um, so the music director here is Robert Spano. And he's um, he's had, like his approach has been to he has this thing called the Atlanta uh, Atlanta School of Composers, and it's like a really um, it's kind of very a, a very specific um, like a sound, I guess, that, that all the composers he, he chooses to commission, he, he kind of focuses on like maybe five or six composers that are all like kind of kind of tonal and kind of uh, accessible and, uh, you know, more like, it's not, it's definitely not like, you know, Boulez, um, uh, it's, it's just more, you know, easily accessible on the ear to the, to the local. Yeah. Team. And, I mean, like I said, that, and we, we we perform a lot of new music here. Um, and, and I mean, the other thing is I think Atlanta is definitely like, I mean, just like their DNA is that they're kind of more of an American orchestra. So uh, they're, you know, we're perform, if we perform new stuff, it's normally by Americans. And if we're commissioning stuff, it's by Americans. And whereas Cleveland, to me, is... is at its root, more of a European orchestra, and so when they're commissioning things, um, and like I said, I'm not like that intimately, you know, um, aware of what they do. My from just my outside understanding this point, they seem, you know, they'll they uh, they're commissioning more, like I say, um, 
European composers or something that might fall more and you know that might be more uh, challenging to the, um, the do I think that their their audience is probably you know I think every audience in every city is, is slightly different and I think you know if sure. a successful yeah. orchestra knows how to um, really thread that needle and find stuff that's you know that works for the, for the city as far as what they offer people um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's definitely like a huge uh, question. But I mean, it used to it used to really consume me as far as like, man, is this like a dangerous to be involved in? And at the end of the day, or you know, like, are the orchestras going to disappear or whatever? And at, at the end of the day, um, I'll, I just kind of come back to like playing in an orchestra. It's like what I'm really passionate about. So. That's what I'm gonna do, and if they if they fold, then like, then at least I'll have had like um, my time with that until it folds. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can always eat beans. Yeah. I think that's I think that's <laughs> I think that's such a cool way to view it. Like. Yeah. I mean, and, and speaking of what Laurel was Laurel's topic with the with the with the reading and advocacy and like doing advocacy for yourself and how that actually does advocacy for for bigger things that's something I've always told people like I'm just going to do this is just always what I wanted to do I didn't have some master plan mm -hmm. and, and and talking with Tom about the modern snare drum competition too like I never got a sense that you're like ooh okay first I'm going to do this and then I'll get the money and then I'll get the sponsor and then it'll be huge and then it's just like mm -hmm. it's it's just great to hear you say it's like no it's just something I wanted to do and like doing what you want to do is like really good for the the world, you know, yeah. and given that what yeah. you want to do isn't like something terrible. Um, so anyway, it's just it's just great to. Well, that goes uh, without saying. I guess. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've said I've said some stupid things already this episode, so I'm trying to be careful. You know, I don't want to I don't want to strike out and break Google Hangouts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, Tom, are you still a avid movie goer? Yeah, yeah, we of course. Saw, um, do you remember what movie we saw together? Man, <laughs> he doesn't I don't, remember. Wait, it wait. was like it was like it was like a memorable moment for me. He doesn't care though. <laughs> I'm I'm shocked that we had time. Oh wait, I do. Did we go see? Uh, it was a zombie movie. That's right. Yeah, it was yeah, a zombie. It was. Movie. Uh, Oh man, it was uh, it was World War Z. Is that what it was? Yeah, World? there we go. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Hey, speaking, check out this segue, Ben. Speaking of movies, very nice, Casey. Yeah, so, I I wish I had done that on purpose, but I'm gonna pretend <laughs> I did. Speaking of movies, uh, Dr. Ben Charles has uh, a history topic that I got uh, time, uh, timed with a certain birthday, so take yes. it away, buddy. So let me, uh, first and foremost, let me get on my party hat. <laughs> <laughs> this How episode, this <laughs> episode will be going up, hopefully, as if everything goes as planned, this episode goes up on September 3rd. Um, and September 2nd is a, a very... <laughs> Very, very famous percussionist birthday, mm. and I would venture that this is probably the most listened to percussionist of all time. Which, if anyone has not figured out who I'm talking about yet, I am talking about Emil Richards, who is one of the most famous LA percussionists that like ever. Um, so he was born Emilio. Uh, Joseph. You know that's Rodolfo. my birthday too, right? It is. Holy <laughs> crap! <It's bad. laughs> Happy birthday, but Tom! Sorry. <laughs> here we we were. Uh, I was playing around with this earlier. We'll get we got a cake for Tom here. <laughs> ben, <laughs> I'm the funny one. I told you, I'm You're gonna have a good one. time with this. So, um, <laughs> where was I? This is Mr. Richards. If you can get a little closer to the camera, it'll actually look like the hat is on your head. <laughs> <laughs> Can I blow the candle out? That no, nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a good time here on at percussion today. Um, so uh, where was I? Emil Richards um, was born September second, nineteen thirty-two, which means uh, happy eighty-third birthday, Emil Richards. Um, 
He was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He started playing the xylophone at the age of six um, and continued his musical studies. He went to college at the Hart School of Music and Hillard College. Um, after his college, he uh, served as the assistant band leader of the First Cavalry Army Band for a couple years. This is just ridiculous. <laughs> You're just going to do, do the whole segment with that. I'm just going to go with I'm doing the whole segment. Like, it's your segment, dude. Okay. It's my history segment. So um, after, after Emile's stint uh, in the Army Band, he moved to New York in 1954, and he played with uh, a lot of the jazz greats of the day, including Charles Mingus, Ed Shaughnessy, and Ed Thigpen. Um, for, he stayed in New York for about five years, then he moved out to L.A. in 1959. He started recording with a lot of people out there, um, including Frank Sinatra, Judy Garland, Doris Day, and a lot of others. Um, and he also joined Frank Zappa's group. Um, so this kind of led to, in 1962, I, st I can't believe I'm still doing this, um, in 1962, he... Uh, toured the world at the request of President John F. Kennedy. Um, J JFK asked Frank Sinatra to start a small jazz combo to tour the world for the benefit of uh, underprivileged children. So Emil was part of that combo. And it was on this worldwide trip that um, Frank Sinatra had a very large plane with, uh, Emil said, a very empty, large belly. So Emil, everywhere they got, um, everywhere they went, he bought a new instrument. So he got, made this incredible collection of world instruments in the 60s, um, which formed his collection that he used for quite a while after that. Um, in 2012, most of that collection was sold off to LA Percussion Rentals, which restored a bunch of the instruments um, and rinsed them out. Um, around that time, around the 60s, he also worked with Harry Parch. Um, and that when he returned to LA, he recorded with artists including the Beach Boys, Bing Crosby, Nat Cole, George Harrison, and a lot of others. Um, at this time also, he became the number one on-call percussionist for the Hollywood film industry. And if you're interested in this, there's a great book written by Emil called Wonderful World of Percussion, My Life Behind Bars. Um, since the... Had a great pun there. Since the <laughs> 1960s, um, he's performed on over 2,000 movies and TV shows, and I don't, po I can't possibly name all 2,000. We don't have time for that. But I just wanted to name a few of those that kind of struck me as significant. So he's played on every Planet of the Apes movie since the original in the 1960s. He played on Jaws, The Exorcist, The Addams Family, which he did the the snaps on the Addams Family theme. The Simpsons, that crazy xylophone lick. The bongos on the Mission Impossible theme. He played on Up, Family Guy, The Flintstones, Scooby-Doo, Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, multiple Star Trek movies, Airplane, Mrs. Doubtfire, Beetlejuice, The Bourne Identity, The Karate Kid, Lethal Weapon, Independence Day, Jurassic Park, Dead Poets Society, Saturday Night Fever, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Super 8, Good Morning Vietnam, The Mighty Ducks, Mulan, Edward Scissorhands, Home Alone, Free Willy, and Predator. So quite a, a long rap sheet of, uh, of movies. And if you're interested in film scoring, in my research I came across a great website called scoringsessions.com. Um, and this website has uh, a lot of photos from, from movie scoring sessions. So there's some great photos of Amal Richards on there. Um, we'll put a, bunch, a couple up on the screen here. You can see from that. Uh, Emil was inducted into the Percussive Arts Society Hall of Fame in 1994. And he is still active today at 83 years of age. So, happy birthday, Emil Richards, from all of us here <laughs> at, at Percussion. And happy now, birthday. take off these ridiculous effects. <laughs> there, there was no movie cooler than Predator when I was a kid. Yeah. When I was 12, <laughs> Predator was like the coolest mm. thing ever. Yeah. I, I just I... want to say that I saw... Super 8 with a friend, and I am not a real movie buff. I don't go out to the cinema that often. And so a friend invited me to go out and see Super 8, and I had no idea of what it was about. So the first time the aliens showed up, my mind was just blown. Yeah, I met Emil Richards in 2009 at ZMF and had a lesson with him and, and everything, and I think he is the tiniest, most jolly, tan little man he I've is. ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say, I also met Emil Richards, and I've got to get Casey the picture of this to show everyone. 
I met him at a world con- mu- world music concert when I was in my undergrad, and I met the guy. I was playing in the Gamelon at the time, so when I met Amal Richards, I was wearing basically a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> a sarong, Ben. A sarong, very good. And also, as far as pronunciation, I've heard both Amal and Emil. Emil is short for Emilio, so that makes more sense, but I feel like I've heard both just as much as the other. It's like Atlanta, Atlantic, yeah. it's the same oh, thing. Dude, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. <laughs> um, hey, let's take a Facebook question for Tom. We did get some Facebook questions that were, I thought, really good questions because uh, they're real specific. Uh, Ted Jackson would like to know, and this is uh, for Tom, how did you approach time management preparing for the audition since you had a good deal already performing with another orchestra? I already asked you that. Um, let me do this other one. He asked two questions. Ted Jackson also would like to know what led you to start a modern snare drum competition instead of one with just standard repertoire. Do you find it difficult to find rep for the competition each year, and how often do you commission for the competition? Uh, some of that you've already answered, but uh, maybe you can elaborate. Yeah. Um, I mean, the word modern in there is just... Uh, <laughs> I didn't really know what else to call it. I mean, I, I, I didn't want that <laughs> that to be... A, I guess I, I guess I threw that in there just to yeah to connotate that it was something current and um, since I was trying to generate new pieces for it but I mean there's I feel like we already have just if you sort of think about a standard well there's really I mean there's no like you know snare drum competition scene out there really but I mean the, DC, the DCI thing would be the closest I guess that there is to that and so I kind of felt like there was already um, we had that that was more like a rudimental rudimentally based approach to playing the snare drum but nothing that's more uh, I don't know the way to, to I don't know concert based I don't know how to how to say that well, I, if I could uh, if I could just maybe add something to Ted's question how often or I guess let's see how how often do, would you recycle a piece of competition rep because I, I I always I always wonder people say like I want to I want to get new music out there and I just wonder like what's better is it better to do something literally brand new or is it better to do something that you know, has been done before, but it's it could still use a little more help. Yeah. I get you know early on when I was when I was doing things, I was trying to like I felt like um like there, there was definitely uh, the desire on my part for this to be somewhat educational, so that like I was turning people on to um to stuff that's out there that maybe people don't know about. So I was trying to like vary every year like what I was asking. Um, but but then as that came on, as as the you know this is the we just finished the eighth year of it, I started feeling um, after a couple of years like less uptight about that. And if there was a piece, like especially if there was a piece that I commissioned that I thought particularly effective or a, a good piece, then I didn't mind asking it again. And I, we've asked several things, you know, once or twice, or repeated them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do try to like have it be as varied as varied as possible, just so that um, that I don't just like I say, so that people's awareness, I think, is just it, it's constantly thinking about what's out there. But there, I mean, it's not like there's this infinite number of good things that are like appropriate for a competition. So, but I, I think I've done a good job just of providing a lot of variety for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I know I was blown away both times I was there. Uh, Another question, uh, Jade Hales would like to know, what do you look for when you are picking a snare drum solo to play? Which of those elements do you throw in when you compose your own solos, and which of those virtues make a solo better than another? Wow, okay. Well, I've only, I've composed two snare drum solos, which was... uh, Real stretch for me, and a real like challenge for me. But um, I, I think like what I look for in a good solo is, I mean, it depends on like what I'm, where it is, and the, like the purpose I, that I'm finding in the competition. I mean, I, I always have like, well, this is kind of like a concert piece, which it might be more like a De La Clue etude or um, even like a Saron etude or something that's just more. Uh, 
like I, like I say, like a classical standard piece of snare drumming. Um, and there might be sort of like a new piece, if that's the way to say that, that might be more about um, being a good performer. So, um, you know, it involved like, um, you know, vocalizing in some way or, or performing in some way um, that, so so whatever I'm looking for, I, I, to me it's going to be something that offers like a vehicle for somebody to be like, you know, expressive um, and maybe virtuosic in some way, whether it's like with their, um, like I say, with how they, how they um, move and behave as a performer, as an artist, or what they're, the, you know, style and or touch that they're bringing to something, or, or if it's just a t you know a technical like if it's technically challenging, um, I mean there's some there's some pieces that are just like, maybe just real uh, real flashy, and 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 choppy that um, I'm not as interested in even though that's like an amazing thing to witness and to listen to as well. Um, I generally have. Uh, Stuff that, like I said, that I, I think um, somebody can be expert with in, in some way, and but, not every you know not every piece, especially on a snare drum. Um, I think that's a that's a challenge a lot of times. A lot of times it's just kind of about you know being perfect and um, to find something that's actually like a really music like a, a piece of music is can be a challenge. That what you, one thing you're talking about brings to mind. One thing we haven't mentioned yet. Um, my other favorite thing. There's the modern snare drum competition commission pieces, and the other kind of collection of pieces that we haven't really mentioned is uh, the Smith publications, the Noble Snare. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't even. I, are there six volumes of that or something? There's quite a few volumes of that, and those also kind of fill all the qualifications that Tom was talking about with using the snare drum in different ways or including vocalizations yeah. or that sort of thing. You know, uh, I have to be honest. Like I'm not. I'm like. Not so into like all of those books. Just like I mean, at least from my perspective, for like a um, for the uh, for a competition, there's there's some there's some great stuff in there. I really like uh, Herbert Bruns' piece, who's a U of I guy, um, and like of course, like a minute of news is like a really popular piece, and I think that's a great piece. A lot of the other ones, I, I think, are like. They're conceptually interesting, but they're not so much um, like to me. They're like they're too simple, or um, it's like you get you know you've got a composer who, like we, we're obviously a lot more um, familiar with complicated rhythms and um, what's possible on a, on a drum. And I, sometimes I think when you get a composer that's got um, no uh, in, in percussion at all um, can tend to write something that they might think is like really interesting but that I think is just kind of you know uninspired or kind of boring yeah. and um, I, I don't know I find a, to me a lot of those or, or it can be like really over um, like it can be just too conceptual that it's that it just doesn't become anything that's like a good musical experience to me so I don't know I find a, um, I just find a majority of those in that book to me. Like I, I've never used that that many of them for the competition, because for the purposes of the competition, where you're trying to like, you know, you do have to create an opportunity for, you know, um, because it is a competition after all, to like be able to differentiate between people, and um, I, I feel like the pieces have to have something that like can let people stand out, you know, and, and do something with and, and make their mark on something. And so, for at least for the competition, those pieces, um, the majority of them to me, I'm not so into but me. Yeah, damn it, Ben, you're embarrassing the podcast. No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. I mean... <laughs> no, I, um, I, I was interested to hear the, the input, actually, because I've... I've, I mean, everyone knows a minute of news, but other than that one, I really, I think I've heard Peeping Tom, and I really haven't heard too many of the yeah. other ones, and in thumbing through, I kind of, I kind of felt what Tom was talking about, but I, I wouldn't say I was qualified enough to, because um, I had never seriously looked at most of them to, to say that out loud, but I'm yeah. glad to hear the, uh, the expert opinion on that. Well, I mean, I'm, that's just, I'm not an expert on it, I just, that's, that's my opinion, I, and I think, like, 
you know, to me, it's 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 interesting as um, like uh, the the guy I've I've commissioned uh, I'm talking to this year is Steve Snowden. Do you know him? Yeah, no. awesome um, stuff. He's he's right piece, and like, man, I have no idea what the hell he, you know, if it's going to be good or not. I mean, I assume it is. You you never know with with, with anybody. And, and it's like I look at that that collection, the Noble Snare collection. I mean, most of those people that are are like really reputable, solid composers. Um, but I mean, just a lot of them, just personally, that just don't speak that much to me. But like, I, I really, um, I I totally respect like the effort and the, um, you know, that that was put into like commissioning those pieces and putting them together in the, in the collection. And I think that's great. Um, and you know, like I say, you never, you just don't know what you're going to get when you ask somebody to write something. Um, and I, I've just, I've just found like you're, you're lucky. Like I, um, one of my, one of the souls I like that I've commissioned is um, is by Nathan Davis, who's a composer. Um, but he's, I mean, he started off as a percussionist, and he he, he he's one of the percussionists in uh, the International Contemporary Ensemble, Music Ensemble out of New York. Um, so to me, if you can find people that that do have some sort of foot in both worlds, they're they're the ones that to me that write what's really interesting stuff. Hey Tom, um, it's it's about time for us to wrap, but I know that the if if I know our audience, I I bet there's a lot of students listening, and if you could give them quick advice for your competition, because um, I know a lot of people want to do it, what what could you tell them? I mean, aside from just like, yeah, know your stuff. <laughs> I mean, and you you could probably attest to this. I mean, the interesting thing that I always find every year is that like, every time we have the competition, we'll have you know, you get out of the final couple of people, and you know, like, okay, well, who was your top you know favorite person? And it's like somebody's top person was somebody else's least favorite person. And everybody has like a different. Um, they just hear things differently, or people push somebody. Somebody pushes somebody's buttons, and somebody doesn't push somebody's buttons. Um, but I mean, like early on, like weeding, you know, is your sort of being process. It definitely seems like. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming now that like you know your 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 time is good, and your and your rhythm is good. I I always find that the people that are doing um, that are offering something beyond that. Um, like it, like musically, you know, technically, um, like uh, I don't, I don't think I think people, especially when it comes to playing snare drum, but really just in all, um, all percussion. I mean, I find, that especially the students today, um, need to spend more time thinking about the sound that they're they're making. Um, so even you know, if you're playing xylophone and you've hit you know the right notes. Um, it's like, well, really, like, you know, how are you, um, how are you manipulating the sound that's coming out of that instrument? And and it's the same. It's a lot more conceptual. Because it's just, you know, it's just a little, such a short little burst of sound. But um, a lot of times, I, I think people just have this approach. It's more like the, um, I don't know. It's like a, I, I kind of think of it as like a the doink in like you. You just hit the thing, and, and then that's it. You haven't really thought about like the motion that you're making before, or after going into the stroke, and, and and the sound that that's producing out of the drum. So, I know this is this isn't a short burst of an answer, but, <laughs> but to me, just like if you, if you really um, spend time thinking about your sound on a snare drum, and, and really to me like. People do have sound, you know. They do have their own sound, drum, which does, I mean, in some ways, doesn't seem like that's possible. But I mean, all the people that I really look up to, um, past and present, they all have like I can hear them, and I know that's this person. I know that that's how that person sounds. I have a sound that, that I that's in my ear, and um, so that to me is like a big thing. And that is is your sound, and then also like I say, your um, I think it just makes a, a big deal, like your presence on stage. Like if you, um, if you have some sort of, um, well, just some sort of presence at all, but some sort of control over what you're, you know, what you're doing as a performer. 
um, and that it's not just about, um, you know, like if you're playing, you know, a De La Cruz Etude or a, a, you know, something like impressions, it's just about, um, you know, technical perfection and accuracy and did I play all the right, or even if it's like a Pratt solo, you know, you're playing the Pratt solo with like a certain amount of style or, you know, swagger or something, that it's not just about like um, perfection. And I, to me, that's like, uh, I mean, personally, that's always been, like a, that's my lesson always to, you know, whether it's with auditions, like for, or for a job or for competitions or just performing, is try to, trying to step outside of that, just being focused on like the, you know, the perfection of what you're doing or the accuracy of what you're going to be about, you know, telling a story or um, expressing something. Uh, on the snare drum, I think that can be pretty abstract, but that's like that's why I think I'm attracted so much to it. Is it sort of really makes you hone in on on those ideas? Well, that's that's certainly what I've noticed about snare drum. Like when you see a good snare drum performance, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I mean, like really good, not just like oh they executed well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like another level of communication you mm-hmm. don't get anywhere else because it is so inherently abstract. Like the right. sound is just yeah, it's it's very hard. It's a it, it exists in this new little space. You guys, thanks so much for the great episode, Tom Sherwood. Thanks so much for joining us. It was really cool to catch up and chat with you. Um, Thanks man. for having me here. Yeah, you're very welcome, dude. We'll have to have you. We'll have to have you back sometime for sure. Yeah. Uh, ben, Laurel, Megan, Megan, thanks for coming late. Yeah, uh, pre- appreciate it. Um, cool, you guys. Were-